All right. Welcome, and thanks for joining us this morning. Um, so, as Rebecca says, my name is Jacques. Um, I've been working on a little project for the last sort of six months to a year. Um, it's all been fairly underground, a bit of a secret, and I'm quite excited to be here today because it's the first day I get to actually tell anyone outside uh, MWRIF Secure about what I've been doing for the last while. So, just a bit about me. Um, as Rebecca says, I'm the technical director in South Africa. Um, I started as a pen tester a bit more than a decade ago, um, and you know, we started with a normal sort of pen testing stuff, web apps, a little bit of internal infrastructure, went on to do a bit of exploit development, did a bit of mobile phone to own, um, then went into the red teaming stuff, and I think that's where I really got interested in this. Um, so red teaming, and these are sort of large-scale attack simulations, primarily against sort of large financial organizations, big banks, this kind of thing. Really exciting work to do. Um, you get to tell a big war story afterwards about all the money you stole, and after you do this a couple of times, you realize that actually it gets a bit samey. Story's the same every time, so fun to tell your colleagues about, but ultimately, the work actually gets really repetitive. If you keep doing the same thing every time, you pretty much realize that, that actually there's a huge problem here, and that's when I got interested in the defensive side and realized that actually the defense is the hard part here. The offense is starting to get really easy. And that got me interested in the cyber defense side of things, and then we started advising clients and really helping them to make sure that this stops succeeding. Um, did a lot of this sort of advisory stuff, and then realized that what we really need is some tooling to, to actually push the boat out here and make sure this, this approach scales. So that's basically what I'm going to be talking about today. So just about, about the talk, um, we're going to be looking a bit about how these attacks have evolved. Um, I think I see a bit of a mismatch between how we're defending and how the attackers are approaching this problem. I'm going to talk to you a bit about that. And I've got a bit of a solution, I think, or at least the start of a solution, into how we can approach this problem and then how we can actually start dealing with this. So um, I'm going to show you a bit of a demo, and then we're going to talk a bit about the future and what we can do going forward. So at a high level, how these attacks change? Well, when I started about a decade ago, the way we approached this problem was a lot like most of the attackers did at the time, right? Organization says, please check if we're secure. We approach their network, look at what they've got on the internet, scan for services, see what's there, find the exploit that matches the service, learn the exploit, get onto the internal network. From that point, we do exactly the same thing, rinse and repeat, right? Scan for everything internally, find every service that's available, find the exploit that matches the service, throw them out there, and see what comes back. And normally, we're doing virtually zero reconnaissance. We don't even know which organization we're attacking. We get an IP range, and that's about the reconnaissance we're doing. So really, what we're saying is like this is kind of the all-in approach immediately. We're just scanning for everything, see how many boxes we can compromise, and hoping one of the boxes we compromise is the asset we're interested in. And that was working for quite a long time, way too long. That kind of approach stopped, stopped working for us maybe sort of eight years ago. Um, we had some organization, as, as Anthony says, that started actually doing this patching thing properly. Um, you know, the operating system exploit mitigation started actually working and making these exploits a lot less reliable. Um, we saw um, you know, the perimeter hardening stuff people were doing actually starting to work. Um, it got really hard actually just going in directly through the perimeter. So I wouldn't say this was, was the case with most clients, but at least uh, uh, 10, 20 percent of them, this was getting hard and unreliable. So we needed a new methodology. So if you need a new methodology, you start looking at what works, and this sort of slowly evolved over the next sort of half a decade or so. Uh, and what turns out what works is going slowly doing a lot of reconnaissance, finding out exactly what the lay of the land is, picking out exactly which path you want to follow, and going really, really slowly. If you, if you shoot a bunch of exploits all over the network, what typically ends up happening is you crash half the estate. These exploits aren't really that reliable anymore. They're noisy, um, and, and you need something that gets you exactly to your target. You can't just go compromising anything. Um, this is the same thing we started seeing with attackers as well. We stopped seeing them doing like internal, you know, internal scans, port scans, which is followed up by a bunch of exploit attempts. That just isn't the way it works anymore, right? So if I can kind of uh, um, use a metaphor to describe these two approaches, the old approach is a bit like a bank heist. Everyone runs in with guns. You shoot the place up and leave with a bag of money. Um, very exciting, but everyone knows it's happened, um, a bit unreliable. Uh, the other approach, the modern approach we're using, is a lot more like insider trading. What we're using is taking a little bit of information here, using a little bit of information there, trading it up, and as we keep doing this, we're, using, we're gaining a little bit of uh, privilege as we keep going. Uh, and by the end, we're, we're rich in both situations, so this new approach is just a lot more reliable. So what's the response been to this new sort of new methodology where we're, where we're a lot more focused on reconnaissance, we're a lot more focused on abusing these relationships between systems? Well, the response has been overwhelmingly detection and response, right? So I, I don't need to convince you there's been a lot more focus in recent years on detection and response specifically. Um, a huge amount of money has, has gone into this. And I think from our perspective as attackers, or at least you know, 
analysts, what we've seen is that a lot of this money hasn't been super effective at, at, at increasing the cost for us to attack these organizations. When we do uh, red team exercises, attack simulations, what we're seeing is like it takes maybe 10% extra time, but certainly not double the time and certainly isn't impossible yet. We're still achieving remarkably high success rates in targeting this. So these controls aren't as effective as we would have wanted them to be or as we were hoping they were going to be. On our incident response team side, what we're seeing is virtually the same thing, right? These attacks have been increasing. If you look at Anthony's presentation, you saw the same thing happening. These breaches are just getting more common. It's increasing every day. So why isn't this working, right? Why hasn't this investment actually paid off, and why isn't it doing what we want it to do? And I think it's not, I don't think the problem is that detection and response is not the right strategy. I think perhaps there's just a mismatch between what we're trying to detect and respond to and what's actually happening in the real world. Um, and I think that's where a lot of this, you know, where a lot of the value will come from in future. So if we're looking at kind of how to encapsulate this mismatch between what the defenders are doing and what the attackers are doing. Um, I think this was summarized really nicely by a guy called John Lambert back in 2015. So he says that defenders think in lists, attackers think in graphs, right? And this is basically the core of the mismatch between these two things. So in a real environment, what you're dealing with is not just a list of assets. You're dealing with a list of assets, but all those assets have interrelated yeah, relationships, security relationships, right? So these are not data flows. They're specifically, you know, which users use these systems, which admins use these systems, how do these systems relate to each other in those, that sort of security context. And so by graph here, I'm not talking about sort of a pie chart or a, a, a revenue chart. What we're talking about really is like, you know what a bullet list is. Uh, we're talking about graphs that look like that. So different nodes that are related to each other. And I'll get into that just a bit more. So I guess it's kind of a bit far out and hard to imagine what I mean by thinking in graph and thinking in list. So let me make that a bit more practical for you. So if you're a, a fairly mature organization and you're doing all the sort of right things that are recommended today, you're probably doing something like a crown jewel assessment or a critical asset assessment. You've identified which systems in your organizations are absolutely critical to the business. Next to that, you've identified the IT systems which are actually supporting that business process, right? You're also at the same time doing vulnerability scans, penetration testing, all this kind of work to identify vulnerabilities, problems um, on, on your internal systems and your perimeter systems, right? So what you're hoping for is that there's not going to be a lot of overlap between those vulnerabilities you've discovered and these critical systems, right? So you may look at this slightly differently in this sort of abstracted network diagram you've got here, and you may say, OK, we've identified this one critical asset. Maybe that's your, you're in financial services, and that's your card processing system. Maybe you're in the health sector, and these are, this is your client information. Now you're also plotting your known vulnerabilities and you're seeing like, okay, we know about a couple of these in the environment and, and maybe everything here needs to be about a times 100, I think, I don't know how many vulnerabilities are in a typical organization, but probably in the thousands. Um, and once you're matching these two things, you can now say like, okay, are any of these vulnerabilities on these critical systems? If they are, let's patch those first. If they're not, everyone's feeling a little better about themselves, right? Okay, we have nothing critically known that's exploitable on these critical assets, so we can breathe easy. The reality is that the attacker is not looking at this thing in the same way, right? They've long since realized that trying to target something on the perimeter is not the way to get into a network. It's not the way to start this attack. It's a lot harder than any other way to do it. So probably nine out of 10 times or more today, what we're seeing is this attack starts with a phishing email. And probably most of the time there, we're exploiting not a vulnerability. There's no remote code execution. There's no memory corruption. There's no zero day being used here. We're exploiting a feature in Microsoft Office. Almost every time. I'm sure this is not news to any of you. So this email gets sent into none of those vulnerable systems. None of the critical assets are targeted yet, right? We're just landing on a random computer inside this network. From there, we're finding maybe a service account or something that gives us access to some kind of dev server on the internal network. It doesn't matter. From there, we find that we can use those credentials to actually access some system administrator's workstation, right, or desktop support engineer. From there, we can see that he can actually log in remotely to the Swift administrator or the payment system administrator's workstation, right? Using those credentials, we're now actually interacting with those payment systems. Now, it's important to note here that by the time we get here, there's actually nothing unusual that's happening there. There's nothing to detect there. We're accessing the production system using correct credentials from the right system inside working hours. There's no way to know anything's gone bad there until it actually happens. The other problem is that everything that precedes this last step is happening really, really quickly. We're no longer spending weeks and months trying to scratch around the internal network, trying to find our way. Because we're gathering so much intelligence, we're actually doing those steps in minutes. So later, when we've got some of the other talks that are looking more at the incident response side of thing, and you see those three-minute stats or, or within-minute stats, this is why it's happening. So 
this is what we mean by, by the attackers are thinking in graphs. We're not focused on the, initial, the individual points on that graph. We're only focused on the relationships that run those things. That's how we're running these exploits. This is how we're managing to avoid having to use zero day. This is why we're not getting caught by antivirus or any of the other typically used tools, right? So we're talking a lot about graph here. Perhaps there's a bit, you, bit more to get into. A little bit of the technical side, just talk a bit about graph databases. I think that's going to help us going forward. So if you think about a traditional database, you have some kind of row in a database. This row contains, so let's think of this as a single object. It has multiple sort of fields. Um, and together, these things create a single object, right? So what we're doing in a graph database is we're not interested in this single object. What we're interested in is the relationship between this object and another object. So instead of storing one object, we're storing a triplet now. We're storing two objects and the relationship between them. And this is sort of critical to the way we're actually getting from the old sort of list thinking into this new sort of way of actually dealing with this problem. So, this represents basically two nodes and an edge that connects them, right? And this becomes critical, because if you store everything you know about an environment in this format, it allows you to ask really interesting questions and get data back that's, that's definitely not in a list format, and, and that allows you to see this thing quite differently. So this has all been really abstract, and I've been talking about like hopping around between these little dots on the graph like it's some trivial thing, like it doesn't even matter and anyone can just do this. If you're ready to call, um, Call shenanigans and say that's not how it works in real life. You're absolutely correct. You can't just jump ad hoc between systems. It doesn't work like that. What you can do is find that dozen systems within a hundred within a hundred thousand endpoints um, that do actually allow you to do this. And that's the challenge we're faced here. So if there are only a couple of dozen systems that are vulnerable or that are misconfigured, and you need to find those within a large enterprise which has hmm, maybe a hundred thousand employees, maybe twenty, thirty thousand servers. Um, this, t this task becomes incredibly difficult, and that's why we need this graph database approach as attackers, right? So how does this look? What does this, what does this look like in practice? So if you take a typical organizational or infrastructure, and you extract actually the security critical components, and you put that in a graph, and you ask the graph some questions, you come up with something that looks a bit like this, right? A bit like the graph I showed you before, but a lot bigger now. So this may be the graph. It looks quite small. There's not a lot of elements on here. This might be for an extremely large network, but this is basically the only bit that an attacker is interested in. If the asset we're compromising isn't on this graph, it's not interesting. And basically what this graph is showing us is that we got some target node here. This is the thing we want to compromise. And everything else on this graph has some relationship to this thing we want to compromise. So if you're on this system here or this have this user account, there's some way for you to viably get to that asset and so and so up the chain. So as long as you compromise some kind of foothold, perhaps you fished a user, and that, fish, that, that user has relationship on relationship on relationship, the attacker can actually jump through each one of these individually, and he knows exactly where he's going if he's got this kind of graph view. So ultimately, if he's got the target, which is typically something like a domain administrator that sets you up really nicely to attack almost any system that's domain authenticated, your only job as the attacker is actually just to execute this whole chain. That's very different from the kind of patch this vulnerability you know, harden that system over there. This is a different way of thinking about the problem. So this tool was uh, written by a couple of French guys back in 2014. Um, and there's a good chance, I think, that this actually served as the inspiration for John Lambert's paper um, because it changed things massively. Now, this kind of technique didn't get really popular until about 2016. And a couple of guys introduced this tool called Bloodhound, which I'm, I'm hoping a bunch of you have heard of already. Um, so this tool actually changed the game quite a lot. Um, this made this kind of uh, graph view approach to compromising systems are really accessible to a lot of you know, attackers. It was written by pen testers for pen testers, but you can be pretty sure this is being used by everyone today. So what am I saying here, right? I think that the thing I'm saying is that we need to change our approach. And what we're missing at the moment is the ability to anticipate how the attackers are seeing our environments. If we're looking at environments or we're expecting the attacker is going to see this view, but the reality is they're seeing that view, we are not going to design the right detection prevention and response controls to actually defend our networks. So where does this kind of anticipation thing fit in, right? Anticipating attacks, predicting attacks. Well, this is actually not a new concept in security. It's a pretty old one. Um, I'm sure you've seen something like this. This is Gartner's adaptive security model. It's on a quadrant. You know, Gartner loves the quadrants. So this matches pretty similarly to the NIST cybersecurity framework. So if you swap predict with identify and respond with response and recover, um, you've got the NIST model. So they're normally presented in this kind of sort of four domains model. And I think this is actually a part of the mistake. Um, because these things, this makes it look like there's no hierarchy, like they're all at the same level. But the reality is like this predicting actually sits outside of this model. This predicting actually shouldn't form the other three. 
If you can anticipate how you're going to be attacked, you've got a lot better chance to actually know where you should prevent, where you should detect, and where you should respond. Otherwise, you're going pretty blindly. And if you go into this thing blindly, you make some pretty good mistakes. So to give you one example, we've already spoken about Bloodhound. So what happened when Bloodhound landed? How do we deal with the problem? Do we go and anticipate how people were going to use this data? Mm. In most cases, no. Unfortunately, what happened is I started getting this question a whole lot. So after we, get, after we gave people like a, a bunch of pen test reports and the results look a lot worse than they did last year, we've improved so much. Why is everything looking worse? Why did you get there quicker? Well, we had some new intelligence. So how do we detect you using this new offensive tool, right? Was that the right question to ask? Probably not. So here's what happens in reality, right? Even if you do detect Bloodhound pretty solidly, and I had a Google last night, and I actually found this company. I don't know anything about them or whether their product works, but they are designing a product which is specifically built to detect people using Bloodhound, right, on your network. Now, I super want to use, I, I definitely want to know if someone's using Bloodhound on my network. That's valuable information to have, but does it actually solve the problem? I think maybe not, because here's how we use this stuff in real life. We're doing a small phishing campaign with some C2 infrastructure we're going to burn almost immediately. We fish one or two users. We run the Bloodhound tool as soon as we've got a foothold on the network. And we're taking that data and exfiltrating it, and we're gone. We're not expecting to keep that foothold. We're expecting for it to be discovered and taken off the network almost immediately. Um, we're burning that infrastructure as soon as we've got the data we want. Now, the detection team, you know, the SOC team feels like they've done a great job. They've actually responded to this problem. They've detected an attack. They've taken the system off the network. They've recovered. In reality, all they've done is they've delayed the attack. Because what happens next is the attacker is taking all that reconnaissance, all that information they've extracted from the network, and they're planning the exact specific attack bot they're about to, about to perform. So next, they know the couple of dozen people they need to fish that gives them direct access to domain admin. And next time they land on that network, it takes them minutes to actually execute that attack because they've pre-planned it before even landing on the network. So was detecting Bloodhound and removing that system from the network the right response? Probably not. Probably what you should have done is looked at the results of the Bloodhound tool, seen, the way, seen your network the way the attacker does that. The problem is if you do this two days before they re-attack, you've got no time to fix anything. You should have done this a year ago, right? So I guess at this point, I'm hopeful you're seeing the kind of value that you can have by actually using these tools properly, using this new recon, this new sort of graph-based approach to looking at networks, and you're ready to kind of go home, download Bloodhound, start using the tools, and, and seeing what your network looks like, I'd certainly recommend you, you go do that. Um, on the other hand, you might find a few problems trying to do, with this approach. Um, and this is kind of where I want to tell you a bit about the project that I've been working on, because this is some of the problems that we've tried solving. So when defensive people start using offensive tools, um, there is a, you know, it's not an ideal situation. This is not what these tools are built for. So you're going to find things like um, they're not super user friendly. They're often scripts whipped together for hackers. They're meant to be used one time and then left. So they do, they're definitely not meant to be deployed in production environments. They sort of work on a snapshot. The attacker doesn't care how your network changes over time. He wants to know exactly what it looks like at the point where he's got a foothold on your network, right? The results are a bit tough to interpret. If you don't have offensive training, it's going to be hard to actually make a make good sense of what's happening there. The other thing we're missing here is that if you're using offensive tooling, offensive tooling is written and designed to be used with little or no credentials. So it's no point if you have to be domain admin to extract the data to become domain admin, you haven't gained anything, right? So what you need to do is have tools that work with basically either zero credentials or very low level credentials like Bloodhound does. The reality is you go into a casino, casino doesn't make the fight fair, right? They have a home field advantage, the house always wins. We have the same kind of advantage on our own networks. We are already domain admin. We have the results of our phishing exercises. We have the VON scans. We have the pen tests. We have all this information. And yet we're not using this. Right? So why don't we build a tool that actually works and incorporates that kind of home field advantage and also makes it easy to use for our defenders rather than some hacky uh, uh, you know, offensive tool? And so that's what I'd like to show you today. So we have a bit of a, oh, no, that's not working. OK, there we go. So this is a tool we've, we've, we've created called uh, F-Secure Pathfinder. Um, and this is what it looks like once you've logged in. OK, so I'll show you a little bit about how we use this tool. So the first thing we're doing is setting a target. So we're on a domain called PewPew now, and this is our lab domain. So what you can see here is basically we've added the domain because we're interested in meeting the compromises of the domain. Now, we could have put in the target as our main Swift server, our exchange server, whatever else we wanted to. But what you're seeing here is the core. If you compromise that node, you become domain admin, and you can 
you can access any system that's domain authenticated or any system that's administered by anyone who's domain authenticated. So in almost all organizations, this is everything. Um, what you're seeing on this graph is that every other node on this graph is able to compromise this node. Now, some of this stuff is, is quite predictable. I mean, you imagine if you compromise a domain controller, you'd compromise the domain, right? There's nothing unexpected there. The administrators, same kind of story. Uh, I'll just take the video there. So by default, we're just collapsing nodes because we find there's often these graphs are a bit bigger than is manageable. So we're seeing the domain administrators, the enterprise administrators, no surprises yet. What we are seeing is this, okay, we're also showing the kind of relationship. So what is the actual thing? What is the security relationship that allows you to jump from one node to the next node? If we're looking at that one, we're seeing an account there called AD Sync. So this is a fairly typical account, and maybe if you've ever done some domain admin work, you'll, you'll recognize that. But this is the account that's used if you have an on-site Active Directory and you're synchronizing this with Azure Active Directory. Some account needs actually access to your directory, needs to be able to pull all this data and synchronize it into the cloud. Still nothing particularly bad there. What we've been asked now, the domain administrator is sitting on the right-hand side here. He's working on the domain controller. That's his sort of raw view. That's his day-to-day -day work, you know, work view. Um, he's been asked to give the service admins group the ability to administer this, this uh, service account, which does the sync. Right? Someone needs to change the credentials or, or update the, the Azure instance, um, and he's been asked to create, a, you know, add privi privileges for the service accounts admins. So as he does that, you can see there's no warning that comes up on the right-hand side here that says, hey, you're about to add a whole bunch of new domain admins to this group. However, when he actually accepts this change, Right there. Within a couple of seconds, you're going to see that we've actually updated this graph. And the graph actually looks significantly different now. So immediately we have feedback that something's changed. Now, something needed to change, but did we make the right change? Is it exactly what we expected? So as we keep expanding these nodes, we're seeing, right, so there's a service account admins group we wanted to add. That's expected. So these are the relationships. And we can see there's actually multiple ways to get from the service account admins to this AD sync account. Again, that's not unexpected because we have just given them the ability to administer this group, but what have we done inadvertently? So as we expand the service accounts group, we can see the sort of five administrators that we've just added there. So Angela, Stanley, Jason, and Kate. Now, something weird with Kate's account there. So it turns out something at some point in the past, Kate's actually asked desktop support to reset her account. So desktop support has the ability to actually force change her password. If they can force change her password, they actually have the ability to change her password and assume her account. Now you know her password. So if you're an attacker and you know you're one of the desktop support accounts, you can now jump up this chain and just keep chaining it all the way to domain admin. So inadvertently, we've actually given all the, the entire desktop support admin team domain admin privileges, ultimate total privileges over our entire account. So it's not a good situation. We're also seeing something else that's a bit funny there. We have this, okay, the dev support team is part of the desktop support team. Okay, then maybe there's a good reason for that. Maybe they have to do some desktop support for the dev team. And if we look at this dev support group, we can actually see hmm, there's something strange there. We have a machine account here inside a user group. Okay, that's a bit unexpected. Um, what we also see here is a guy called Bob Dev, and there's a machine there called Bob Dev. So you can kind of guess what's happened here. Someone tried to add Bob Dev to the group. He accidentally added the machine instead of the user. That didn't work, so then he added the user. Right? This is actually a, a clone of a real example we found off a client's network. Um, as soon as you see that machine account, you realize that there's some antique system or server or service account that gives the whole UK finance team access to this developer workstation. Why does that exist? Who knows? But this is the kind of thing you see happening, because there was no warning on that right-hand side. When that administrator was making this change, there's no view that he was actually adding a quarter of the company to the domain administrators group. And as we expand that UK finance team, we'll actually see how bad the problem is. Right, so suddenly it turns out that everyone and their friend is a domain administrator on this network. So if any one of like a quarter of the company gets fished at this point, the attacker has a direct route to get to domain admin within minutes. It's a terrible situation for us to be in, right? So this kind of shows the value of seeing, seeing your network in this way, because this is how an attacker is going to look at your environment. If you can see this, at least you have the ability to see what's happening, see these changes, and if it gets worse, there's a very visual way to see this. So now we need to fix this situation. So typically what happens is this situation exists for six months, then the pen testers come, 
they give you a report that tells you this is a, you, you probably have a bad situation here. You might not have expected this. Your administrators make some changes. They think they fixed the problems. Six months later, there's another pen test. And they tell you, hey, you haven't actually addressed the problem at all. The value of looking at it in this way is that you can make the change and actually in real time see whether the change has had the effect that you wanted. Right? The change hasn't worked, the graph doesn't change. If the graph gets smaller, you're improving things. It's pretty, uh, pretty intuitive. So as we make this change and we remove the UK team from that, from that dev box, or we remove that dev box from the user group, you'll see the graph shrinks. We're looking a lot better again. So I think I'll leave it there for the demo. Okay, so if we're using this approach, what does our job become? If the attacker has to go forward in this loop, what do we do as the defenders? Well, it turns out we just do the exact opposite. We start with a critical asset and we work our way back, right? So if those are the things we're interested in, let's look at the graph and work our way backwards. We can see that there's actually two systems that link to that system and we've got a multiple other systems. We start building up this graph and now we understand this view. Once we understand this view, the next time the attacker comes into the network and actually sends a phishing email, how do we deal with this problem? Well, hopefully we've already dealt with this problem, but now we know that we can either go do phishing training for all the people in that group, specific targeted education, or we can just break this relationship. If we break this relationship, we can kind of forget about all those users. They become just like everyone else on the network. They're not special anymore. So we actually have the visibility now to decrease that attack surface as we're going in a really nice visual way. So I think this is a, it's a pretty useful thing to start doing. So, um, You'll have noticed in the beginning I was talking a lot about systems in general and graphs in general, and then I started talking a lot about Active Directory. Why did I do that? Um, so we do a lot of these exercises in, in our consulting services. Um, and we typically call this something like threat modeling or attack path mapping. And the results of that exercise look something like this, right? We, have, we build these graphs and we understand the data flows, we understand the interconnections between systems. We graph them out so that you have some idea how to resolve this problem, right? What we find is that typically the most of the problem exists is AD. Active Directory is responsible for most of this thing. Now, if you're the Swift team and that you've commissioned this exercise, what you're normally asking us to do is saying, hey, we don't actually control anything in Active Directory. We're the Swift team. We want to fix the problems in Swift. Um, we're not interested in the Active Directory stuff. Please put that in a separate report. And so we go, OK, cool. This is what it looks like then. But remember, you've got this really big problem here. And then we go to the next team. And a similar thing happens, right? And then we go to the next team. Similar things happens. And once we've got all the crown jewels assessed, we realize that the only thing that actually compromises all of these systems at once is domain admin. That's why we've always had such a strong focus on, on, on Windows Active Directory, because if this goes wrong, trust me, there's almost nothing you can do. Everything else will fall apart if Active Directory falls apart. It's the core of your security architecture. And so you'll see the research we've done over the years has changed as well. A couple of years ago, the research was very much focused on how do you exploit the Windows kernel. Um, you know, what can you do to actually build new, find new zero days, all these kinds of things. And this approach has changed a lot. And now we're talking a lot more on how do you actually architect the system. So it's not about finding and squashing zero day bugs now. It's now about how do you architect the system to become resilient against these things. So that graph of yours probably looks like a horror show, like it does for most organizations run, running this thing the first time. And as you start implementing these new sort of uh, uh, architectures, you start seeing the value of doing something like a red forest, doing something like ESEA. Um, and all these kinds of things. So, you know, take a look at those papers as well. But, but definitely, these techniques, I hope, you, I hope I'm starting to convince you there's some value here. So that's where we are today. We can give you a pretty good idea of AD. Um, but what's next? So uh, we have the graph core at the moment. So this allows you to do some, some visualization of generic graph components. We have the ability to import some stuff from Active Directory. We'd like to extend that a little further. So using the home field advantage, we're already getting, we're using that advantage um, by being able to synchronize this data in in real time. We don't have to take snapshots and wait an hour for that snapshot to process. We can see this thing happening in real time, a big advantage, but we can go further. So we can extract some data which attackers with low privilege credentials don't have access to. So we can look at password hashes between people with, let's say, your normal user account and your administrative user account, and people, if they're sharing passwords between those two, we can detect those kinds of things. So these are the kinds of things we're going to be looking at in the near future. We can then also integrate the other information we have. If you've done a phishing campaign and you know who's susceptible to phishing, why not enrich the graph for that information? If you have vulnerabilities, if you know what's, if there's a reliably exploitable vulnerability on your network, and that vulnerability gives you access to something which leads onto a graph, then you want to know about it and prioritize that. Maybe this is the thing that helps you pick out the 20 things from the 10,000. 
We can also enrich this data with something like EDR and EPP. So if we know there are agents running on your network that are supposed to be helping you uh, detect these problems, are they actually deployed on the systems that are part of this graph? If you've got 99% coverage, is that 1% on the systems that are actually vulnerable? Well, it's really good to be able to tell that, yes, everything on this path already has an agent. We'll at least be able to detect these attacks when they happen. Next off, we think it'll be pretty useful to be able to look at a time series data. So what did this graph look like a month ago? What's changed since then? Have things gotten better or worse? Um, replay every change that happened over the last week. Um, you know, was there a point for two days over the weekend while we were actually horribly misconfigured? Let's be able to look at that. I think that's going to be really useful. Um, for remediation support, so obviously if, the, if we know what the relationships are, can we just right click and say delete relationship? Um, technically we can. Uh, it's quite dangerous to do that, so we need to think really hard about that, but, but these are the kinds of things we're thinking about. Um, and then finally, uh, we've been talking about kind of a very traditional model here where everything's sort of on site and in Active Directory, um, but we know where the future's going and, and there are definitely other avenues we need to explore as well. So, so cloud is a big focus for us and, and Craig's going to be talking to you a bit about our research in that area and, and the possibility of taking these same approaches and, and pushing the boat out into that environment. Um, so for everyone who's here today, um, I'd like to invite you to join our pilot program. Um, so we're going to make this uh, the service available for everyone who's here today um, for up to a year. Uh, free to use. Uh, we want to get people using the tool. Tell us if we're going in the right direction. Is the tooling we're creating actually useful? What are the features we need to prioritize to make to, to give you the most value and, and to get the most out of the sort of uh, attacker mindset view of, of your environment? Um, so if you contact your account director, they're going to give you the details to get in touch with us, and then we can deploy this within sort of minutes. It's really quick and easy to deploy, fortunately. So um, in conclusion. I think the most key thing we need to do to fix the current situation and, and really get the value out of all this tech we're buying is, is to start doing a better job of anticipating how we're going to get attacked. Um, I think the sort of graph thinking we've been talking about is, is really crucial to actually doing that anticipation because today that is how attackers are viewing this environment. Um, and finally, I'm really hoping to get feedback from all of you once you've started using the tool. Tell us where, where we're going wrong, where we need to add new features, and, and what's important to you.